women make decisions, the decision was taken on the basis of what was best to save human life. I mean, no matter how painful a situation is, you tell them that men don't cry, you know, so men are not supposed to cry. That's a, like a taboo, you know, that means they are losing their manhood, okay, their respect and dignity and everything that goes with their wishes. I still remember the screeching sounds of sirens that bothered me even today. Every time I heard those screeching sounds of sirens, I knew that people were dead. Uh, our graveyards were getting filled. It was actually playing a game with us. You know, every time you thought you had, you know, uh, uh, and overcome the, the virus in one place, and then it shows up in another place. I can only say that it was a time of terror. I mean, when I got the message from one of our local authorities in the uh, north or western part of Liberia, that a strange, a strange disease had broken out um, from those who had come across from the Republic of Guinea. We didn't know what it was, and so, but then quickly it began to spread. More people began to die. The symptoms were not things that our health officials in that remote area of our country had any knowledge about. And so then people got fearful, and people start running, running from away because people were dying. Oh, and I had to make a decision. I mean, like, the, the, the number of people dying was just more than we could handle in barrel places. The decision was taken on the basis of what was best to save human life. And women take decisions on what's best to protect human life. And so that's not always a consideration, we think, taken by men. who are more concerned, I think, with remaining in the positions of authority and, you know, the macho uh, type of things. The women are not concerned about that. They're concerned about the results and they're concerned about humankind. First response was, oh no, you can't do it. Uh, our way of life is to make sure that we have a place where we can go, you know, to where our family or our loved one remains are. I was not trained for Ebola. Imagine those young people who were doing this every day, every day, every day for the entire period. You know, my, my concern for them is that, you know, they may need a lot of psychosocial support. Some of them could not just look at meat to eat. Uh, a lot of them were drinking. Yes, a lot of them were drinking, tend to smoking. Even those that were not even drinking before. Um, a lot of them had sleepless nights. For those who, who rarely saw the manner in which people died, I mean, I mean, these were horrific types of death. You know, people losing eyesight, you know, blood pouring out of their nose, their mouth. You know, uh, that's enough uh, to create a trauma in, pe in people. And after that, the crematorium and even the, the burial team we did not receive sacrosocial team to even give assistance to talk to the team, sacrosocial aspect. Yeah. 
sit here and cry among uh, his fellow colleagues. He could not even express uh, deeply how they feel and how traumatized they are. That's a, like a taboo, you know. Uh, that means they are losing their manhood, okay? Their respect and dignity and everything that goes with their wishes. No matter how painful a situation is, they, you tell them that men don't cry, you know? So men are not supposed to cry. Sometimes, you know, these cultural, you know, barriers tend to, tend to prevent people from being able to deal with, you know, whether it's trauma or pain, you know, other forms of pain, you know, in ways that will probably help them. I think the fact that mental health is as important to every aspect of our well-being, you know, tells us that it's not just Ebola that should make us build into our healthcare systems interventions that would address mental health. I'm very proud to have been the one who was leading Liberia when Ebola was with us and were able to fight that terrible, tragic disease in what is reported to be record to me.